Yeah, I'm Lainey Kinzel. I'm a software engineer. I work on the product infrastructure team at Facebook. And back in January at ReactJSConf, uh, two of my teammates, Dan Schaefer and Jing Chen, gave a talk introducing Relay, which is our data fetching framework for React, and the query language that it uses called GraphQL. So today in this talk, I'm going to start with a description of Relay and GraphQL for anyone who didn't see their talk or who needs a refresher, and then I'm going to dive into some specific parts of the Relay framework. So let's start by thinking about how we at Facebook were doing client development a year ago. At that point, we developed React, and we had also developed the Flux architecture, which provides a pattern for one-way data flow through an application. And when we used both React and Flux, we found that we could move faster in the development process, and we could build more robust, reliable applications. Um, but there was one big problem that neither React nor Flux really addressed that almost every client developer has faced at one time or another, which is, what's the best way to fetch data from the server and to organize that data once it's on the client? <clears throat> so let's look at how data fetching might work in an application built with React and Flux. I'm going to use this example of a newsfeed story that I wrote about JSConf, um, and in particular, its likes and comments section on the bottom. So this like and comment box is, was one of the first parts of Facebook that we wrote with React and Flux. It's a really central part of Facebook, one where you get people from a bunch of different teams coming in and changing it frequently, whether they're updating the design or adding new features. So it's kind of a hot, hot part of Facebook. So let's consider the example of introducing stickers in comments, which is something that we actually did last fall. Let's say that in this part of the application, our component tree consists of this comment box, which contains a comment list, which contains a series of comment items. So how does each of these components get the data that it needs? The data comes from the server, and then it'll get passed down through the component tree. So comment box is going to get some set of data, and then it'll take a subset of that and pass it into comment list, and then comment list will take subsets of that data and pass that into each of the comment items. In this model, the important thing to notice is that every component needs to be aware of the data that its children need so that it can pass the right data down. And then that server endpoint up there needs to be aware of the data required by every single component in that tree. So in other words, the implementation details of each component, the details of what exact data each component needs are leaked up to the parents and to the server. Why does this matter? Well, it means that if, if you come along and you want to introduce sticker comments, you can't just make a change in comment item. You're also going to need to change comment list, comment box, and that server endpoint. This is not cool when you need to change all those files, especially when you have different people coming in, all trying to make their changes and needing to modify all those files every time. You end up with more conflicts and just generally slower development process. Moreover, things can get pretty confusing when you have your data fetching logic in one place on the server and then your rendering logic on the client. So let's say that you look at your server endpoint and you see that you're fetching the birthdays for all the commenters on a story. It's really hard to know at a glance whether and where this birthday data is being used in your application on the client. So maybe someone ran an A-B test a few months ago and they wanted to see what would happen if they added birthdays for commenters and it didn't really work that well, so they removed that code from the client. And now, whoops, we have this overfetching situation where we're loading that birthday, sending it to the client, and then we're not doing anything with it, and so it's just wasteful. So maybe we're going to try to do a good deed and clean up the server, remove that birthday code, without realizing that there actually is some corner of the application where we're still using the birthdays. And now we have an underfetching bug, so we're going to send some data the birthday won't be there, and things won't be good. <laughs> um, it's pretty easy to, for these data fetching pieces and the, and the rendering pieces to get out of sync like this, and it'll often cause either overfetching or underfetching. So how would this work in a perfect world? Ideally, if we wanted to introduce sticker comments, we would only need to change that comment item component. And more generally, rather than having our data fetching logic strewn throughout the application and on the server, it would reside in just one place, the same place where we do our rendering. This is the idea at the core of Relay, that to make development easier, we should keep our logic for data fetching and rendering in the same place, namely within the React component. So 
Rather than just containing the logic to render itself, like a traditional React component, a relay component also contains a declaration of the data that it needs in the form of a data query. This way, when someone wants to make a small change, they can just find the relevant component, change its data query and its render method, and then they're done. You don't, they don't need to go change parent components or touch the server. With the data query and the rendering in one place, it's also a lot easier to know when you're fetching data that you don't, don't use or trying to use data that you didn't fetch. So you're less likely to get those overfetching and underfetching bugs. In order to achieve all these benefits of putting the data query in the component, we needed a common way for the components to declare their data requirements. And this is where GraphQL comes in. GraphQL is a data querying language. And for the last couple of years, our, our uh, client applications at Facebook have been using GraphQL to describe their data needs. Let's look at an example of what a GraphQL query actually might look like. So let's, let's think about the data that we need to render um, a a, a comments author here. So we want the, the ID of the person, the person's name, and then some data that we need to render the profile picture. So look what happens if we highlight just the fields here and remove the values. That's a GraphQL query. As you can see, the query here not only expresses the data that it needs, but also the precise nested structure that we want the response to that query to have. GraphQL is designed to be a thin layer over an existing data model so that clients can get the benefit of writing queries like this one without the whole server needing to be totally rewritten. Another important feature of GraphQL is that um, you can compose queries. So basically, one GraphQL query can be built up of other GraphQL queries. So this means that if you take a component tree like this for an application, on the one hand, you can look at it as a way to build a view for the whole application. So each parent component will render its children. In the same way, you can take this component tree and look at it as a guide for how to build the GraphQL query for the whole application. Each parent component's GraphQL query is composed from the queries of its children. So now that you see what GraphQL is, we can look at how Relay works overall. Each Relay component contains this query and the render method. Relay is going to take the queries from each component and build up that overall query and send that to the server. The server is going to respond. And then Relay puts that response data into a single store. And then it'll use that data to construct props that it sends out to the components for rendering. At its core, this is a Flux application. The only difference is that rather than having several or many stores, a Relay application just has this one single store containing generic logic for dealing with GraphQL data. Having this single store provides a number of nice benefits. So for one, it reduces the need for a lot of the Flux boilerplate. Um, it also helps with data consistency across different parts of the application. And finally, it lets us build certain common product patterns, something like paginating through a list of items, something that you guys have probably implemented at least once, um, right into Relay so that people don't need to build them from scratch every time. So now that we see how Relay works, let's look back at this sticker common example and see how much easier Relay is going to make our lives. Rather than needing to change a bunch of files up the whole tree and the server, we just change common item. So more specifically, let's say that this is part of our GraphQL query. Um, right now, we're just querying for the text of the comment. And now we can also ask for the sticker, use that in our render method, and we're done. We can go build other awesome stuff in the time that we would have spent changing those other files. So Relay solves this big problem of how to fetch data in a way that we found scales really nicely to a complex application being developed by a big engineering team. So because you have that data query and the render method encapsulated within the component, it's easy for a lot of people to work on a lot of different parts of an application at once. So I can make my changes, my teammates can make their changes, people on other teams can make their changes, and we don't need to worry as much about whether we're stepping on each other's toes and whether we have full context on what every other person is doing at that time. So far, uh, you've heard about the read path in Relay. But a framework would, be, would have limited usefulness if it didn't also support a write path, if it didn't let developers um, give users a way to take actions, such as liking a story, maybe even liking my own story. Um, so I'll use the term mutations to refer to these actions that a user can take in an application. So in Facebook, this could be something like sharing a link, RSVPing to an event, or poking a friend. 
And for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on how mutations work in Relay. So to start, I'm going to go back and talk about how we at Facebook, at least, were building mutations before Relay. So I joined Facebook a little over three years ago, and I was working on the Newsfeed product team, uh, mostly working on the home page of the website. And I got really familiar with writing mutations like this. I would write some custom JavaScript, and I would write a custom server endpoint. I would have the JavaScript call that endpoint. I would have the endpoint return data in basically whatever format I chose. Um, then I would have the JavaScript make sense of that data and update the views accordingly, usually by manually updating the DOM. And then maybe I wanted to also use that same endpoint from a different part of the client. I would need to shove some more messy logic in there to make sure that the server was returning the data that the client needed regardless of where it was being called from. And the keyword here is custom. Basically, every time my teammates or I wanted to implement a new mutation, we had to start from scratch. I personally really disliked this pattern of writing mutations with these custom endpoints and custom client code. It felt really repetitive and error prone to me. And in my mind, this pattern became kind of synonymous with writing JavaScript because I had just started at Facebook, I came right out of school, this is what I did every time I would write JavaScript. So to me, this was JavaScript. And so I came to think of myself as someone who really didn't like JavaScript and didn't want to write it. It wasn't until I was introduced to React and Flux that I started to realize that I don't dislike JavaScript, I just like this kind of gross pattern of, of using it. So I, I wouldn't have guessed three years ago that I would be now on a team where I'm writing JavaScript full time or here with all of you guys at a JavaScript conference, but here I am and I'm pretty excited about it. So um, back to mutations. We, we took a step in the right direction when we introduced a more structured API for doing writes as part of our graph API. So this was nice because it gave the client a standardized way to specify what mutation they wanted to do and also to provide the necessary inputs in a structured way. But what about the data that, that the server returns? Since each write endpoint in the Graph API is being used by a bunch of different clients, there's not really a great way to make sure that the server is going to return the data that any client might need to, to update itself. So what we would do instead is usually provide these pretty minimal responses, usually just an ID. So maybe if it was um, the mutation was writing a comment, we would just return the ID of the new comment, or maybe even just a Boolean saying this mutation succeeded or it didn't. And so at that point, there's two main options for how you update the client. You can guess. You can say, OK, I got this Boolean. Things worked, so this is how I think the data should look now. Or you could do a second round trip, go back to the server, and get the data that you need if you want to be really sure that it's right. Um, the first option has issues with correctness, potentially, and the second has issues with efficiency. So neither one of those is really ideal. Ideally, the response from the server would contain exactly the information that the client needs to update itself. So let's talk about liking a story. Let's say we have this mobile client and it shows the number of people who've liked the story. Then we would want the server, if you did a like, to return the new like count so that we could update the story correctly. Um, in our web client, instead of just showing the number of likes, we show this thing that we call the like sentence. And it's, it's an internationalized string that we generate on the server that provides some social context about who else has, who, who of your friends or who has liked the story. So for this, we would want the server to actually return the new like sentence so that we could do the update. OK, but then what if we wanted to change the mobile client to also show the profile pictures of the likers? Then we would want to make sure to update the server so that it also returns the new likers picture so that we can show that when someone likes it. And then maybe if eventually we took out those pictures, we would need to clean up that server endpoint and get rid of the liker picture. And this situation should, should start feeling kind of familiar to you. It's similar to what we saw with data reads, where we were in that situation where the server endpoint needed to be aware of the details of the client's rendering logic. When we change the client rendering, we need to change what we return from the right endpoint on the server. And it gets kind of tough and time consuming to keep those two places in sync. Just like before, Relay and GraphQL can help us solve the problem. So it turns out that GraphQL doesn't just support doing data reads, it also supports writes, GraphQL mutations. So how would this work? Um, in GraphQL, if you want to do a data read, you just provide a query and you get a response. Mutations are a little different. So you need to provide three pieces of information. The type of the mutation that you're trying to do, any inputs, that'll usually just be an ID or two, and then 
a query for the data that you want after that mutation has been performed. So for liking a story, what would this be? The type is just story like. The inputs that you need to give are just the idea of the story that you're liking. And then the query can be anything. But in this case, let's say we want to know if the viewer likes the story. So you know if you should make that little thumb blue. And then the count of the number of people that like it. So when we send this information to GraphQL, it performs the write. And then it runs that query. And then it'll send us back this payload, which we can use to update the client. Relay uses GraphQL mutations for all of its data writes, which provides a standardized way to both perform the writes and then to update the client afterwards. But let's look back at these three pieces of information here. One of the more interesting problems that we faced when developing this mutations framework for Relay was how to decide what this query should actually be. So our goal here was to get the client data consistent with the new post-mutation state of the world. So we want this query to be for anything that we had in the store in, our, in Relay that could have changed as a result of the mutation happening. So one option, the easiest option, is just to have the developer write these queries manually. So in this example, they would write this query. But then let's say someone came and added profile pictures here. We would send this information to the server. The write would happen. We would get this response back. And we wouldn't have the new profile picture in the right size. And, and this would be a bug. <laughs> so to avoid that, the person who added the profile pictures would need to make sure to go find that mutation query, probably somewhere in some other file, and add the profile picture in there. And more generally, we would be, be in this situation where every time someone changed some rendering logic, they would need to remember to go find all of the potentially relevant mutation queries and change them. This wasn't a great option for us, since with Relay, we really wanted to minimize these situations where you make a change somewhere, and then you need to make a change in a bunch of other places. So instead, we put the logic to determine the correct mutation query into Relay itself. How does this work? So intrinsic to every GraphQL mutation is the set of data that can change as a result of that mutation. So this is independent of what any client renders. It's a property of the mutation itself. So it's a property of story like or of comment create. So here's the set of things that can change when we do a story like. And if we always queried for everything that can change every time we did a mutation, we would clearly end up in a consistent state. But we might be massively overfetching, since maybe we never rendered any of that data. We don't care about some of it. So we have Relay keep track for each ID of the set of data that the client has, re has retrieved for that ID and put into its store. So if we had rendered my story Maybe this would be the set of the data that we had fetched from my story. And then when you do a mutation on some story or on some ID, Relay builds the mutation query by intersecting this set of things that can possibly change with the set of things that it knows that it cares about, the set of things that it has in the store. This ensures that we query for exactly the set of fields that needs to be updated. So in this case, we would end up with this query here. And the really nice part of this is that if someone does come along, and let's say they replace that three likes with the like sentence, then Relay, this what we've stored, will know that we've now fetched the like sentence for that story, not the likers count. And so when we do this intersection, the intersected query will be the correct one. We'll correctly ask the server for the new like sentence rather than the like count. So those are the basics of how Relay mutations work. The user takes an action. We send the name of the mutation and any inputs into Relay. And Relay does that intersection to figure out what the query should be. It'll send that over to the server. The server will respond. We'll put that response into the store. And then we'll notify the affected views by sending them updated props. And you'll notice that this diagram is kind of similar to the one I showed you for the read path before. Um, in particular, the second part is identical in the two flows. GraphQL sends us some data, Relay puts it in the store, and then we send the props to the components. These parallels between the read and the write flows are not a coincidence. Just like Flux, Relay treats data writes as first class citizens by using the same core logic and code to handle both reads and writes. So if you've written mutations before, you'll know that even when you have v1 working, when you have the write actually happening on the server, and then the client getting updated correctly, there's, there's often a lot more work to be done. So 
maybe you have to think about things like uh, making the app feel more responsive by having the client kind of doing fake updates instantaneously. Or you have to worry about how to handle errors, timeouts, retries, or things like race conditions. Um, because Relay has this centralized mutations framework, we're able to take a lot of these common concerns and put them into Relay itself so that developers get, that, get the handling of those issues for free rather than needing to solve them again and again with each new mutation. So let's start with that app responsiveness example. If I implemented story like the way that I've described so far and then someone used this app and hit the like button, they'd notice a significant delay between when they hit like and when, when the app actually uh, changes because we're sitting there waiting for the server response to come back, waiting for that GraphQL response. It would be nice if we didn't have to deal with this delay. Uh, and lucky for us, Relay provides support for what we call optimistic mutations, where we immediately update the view uh, to the expected post-write state, being optimistic that everything will work out nicely on the server. Essentially, to make this happen, you can provide a payload mimicking the server response, and then the view will change instantly based on that payload. So that optimistic payload doesn't have to include everything that would be in the server update. It can include as much or as little information as you need to make things feel right. So it's kind of just a, we want this to feel good in between when we're waiting for the server response to come back. So maybe for story like, we would just do an optimistic payload like this. Just flip does viewer like to true. And that would cause the, the thumb to turn blue immediately. But maybe you would think this is kind of weird because you still see two likes. So you could do this instead as the optimistic payload, where, where now you're also incrementing the count by one so that you'll get the three likes and the blue thumb instantly. If I had wanted to do an optimistic update like this back when I was writing mutations for the newsfeed team, I would need to just add a bunch of code to manually update the DOM. Um, in a React application, I could call set state to get my component to re-render with this new optimistic data. But in Relay, I just provide this optimistic payload, and then everything else happens automatically. The framework automatically will update the views. So I want to describe now how these optimistic mutations happen behind the scenes. Even though the view is changing immediately with the optimistic update, Relay isn't immediately overwriting the data in that GraphQL store. So instead, we maintain a queue of in-flight mutations, mutations that we've done the optimistic update, but the server response hasn't come back yet. And when we read data from the store, we read through that queue. So what does that look like? Let's say that this is the data in our store uh, for my story. So the UI is going to reflect what we have in the store. And then let's say I do a like. So you'll notice that the UI block immediately changed blue, but the store, we haven't changed anything in the store yet. And now I do a comment. Again, because of the optimistic update, the UI changes instantly, but the store is still untouched. So now we get the server payload. Let's say the like succeeded. This is when we'll actually remove that like from the queue and update the store. So now, what if we get an error for the comment? So if, if we had immediately written that comment into the store when, as soon as I did it, this is when we would be in a little bit of a sticky situation because we would need to kind of roll back our changes, make sure that we left the store in the exact state that it had been before. But because we maintain this queue, all you need to do is remove it from the queue, the store is still in good shape, and the UI goes back to taking the comment away. The mutations queue also makes it simple to deal with retries. So let's say that I'm trying to comment and say thanks to my friends here. So I hit post, and the optimistic update happens immediately, and is added to the queue. And then an error comes back. So in the example I just showed you, I took the, I just said, OK, there was an error. Take it out of the queue, revert. Um, but what we can also do is keep it in the queue, but mark it with an error state. And the view can pick up on this error state and show that little message, unable to post comment, try again. And then if I do hit try again, it's easy to perform that retry, since we have that comment mutation sitting in the queue, and it contains all the data that it needs to basically send itself off to the server again. So I hit retry, and this time it works, and voila. So a final nice feature of Relay Mutations framework is that it provides a solution for race conditions that you can get when someone is performing a quick sequence of mutations on all affecting the same object. So let's say that I quickly like and unlike my story a bunch of times in a row. Um, there's a pretty high chance here that something's going to go wrong if we just didn't have any special casing for this situation. So there's a race condition for my mutations hitting the server. If, the, if I've ended up on an unlike, 
but the like is the last one to hit the server, then we're going to have the wrong state of data on the server. And even if that all works out, we have another race condition for those payloads coming back, where if the last one that comes back is the like, then we're going to have an inconsistent state on the client. In Relay, we have a way to detect that these mutations are dependent and guarantee that only one of them is in flight at a time. So the first one goes off, and only when that payload comes back do we send off the second one, and so on. So all the optimistic writes still happen immediately, so the person using the application doesn't know that we're doing anything different behind the scenes, but we do this thing to ensure that we're not going to get these collisions. So all of what I've described so far, Relay and its mutations framework, are already being used in a few places in production at Facebook, including our standalone groups app and our mobile ads manager app, which are both using both Relay and React Native. I'm going to spend the last few minutes here discussing a part of Relay that we're still working on that's not yet in production. So this was the diagram that I showed earlier to explain mutations. As I explained, Relay can take this mutation payload from GraphQL, store it, and then send the props to any affected views. So here, the action is originating from the person who's using the application. But that doesn't have to be the case. So imagine if Joe comments on my story from his phone. We can actually use this same path, once it goes through the cloud, <laughs> to send his mutation payload to Relay, put it in the store, and then update the views to show his new comment. So we call this a subscription. Basically, if I'm looking at a newsfeed story, I can subscribe to all new comments happening on that story. And at the time that I subscribe, I'll provide a GraphQL query saying, here's the query for what, what data I want for every new comment that comes in. And then using a pub sub system in the back end, we can ensure that all of these mutation payloads for each new comment are delivered whenever someone comments, and then Relay will automatically update the views. So along the same lines of, say, Meteor or Firebase, this subscriptions piece of Relay provides a simple way to build dynamic applications that feel alive with real-time updates. And this is something that we're excited about integrating into various parts of Facebook. So I'm going to close with just a few last points. Um, the core idea of Relay, just to reemphasize that, is that we should keep our data fetching logic together with our rendering logic within each component. Because we found this approach to really scale well to a big application being built by a big team. One of our main goals when we've designed Relay has been to identify these problematic patterns that people are facing again and again and that are slowing them down and pull the complexity of those patterns into Relay. So we saw a few examples of this today with Relay mutations, from the way that we do that intersection to determine the correct mutation query, to the way that we have optimistic updates in that queue, to our solution for race conditions. In each case, someone using Relay will get these common problems solved for free and can focus on bigger and better things. So I'm going to close with one last sticker comment. Thank you all for listening.